three. I will start with an economic outlook and what the corresponding view on the market, as well as specific sectors and our top stock picks uh, are. I will spend a lot of time on this one. There's actually a lot to look forward to in today's presentation. And unfortunately, we probably don't have that much time. So I'm, I'm going to speak a lot more of the macro outlook and the outlook on the market. And then uh, if we will have time, then we will go to the sectors and I will have the individual analysts covering those sectors to speak on their sectors and their top stock picks. And we will then move on to the, uh, to the Q and A for questions on sectors and stocks that any one of you might may have as well as questions on our presentation. So I'll start by highlighting the resilience of the Philippine economy. And this shows you the historical GDP growth of the Philippines from 1997 to 2021. And in 1998, there was a decline of 0.5% in the Philippines GDP as a result of the Asian financial crisis. But you will note that this was actually the lowest decline among all economies in the region, no? starting with declines of 13.5% in the case of Indonesia and 8% in the case of Thailand. And the case of the Philippines decline was really more because of El Nino, because that pulled down agriculture. No? But other than that, consumption spending and growth of industry and services, um, as well as exports, were still strong in 1998. And then if you fast forward, it was only in 2008 after the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the ensuing global financial crisis that, um, that happened, um, during which uh, GDP growth came under pressure again. No? But in 2009, following that global financial crisis, the Philippines still managed to grow by a positive 1.4% as against the 1.3% decline in global GDP. And then moving forward, the Philippines continue to enjoy economic growth uh, north of 5% on the average. You know, in fact, the more recent average was closer to 6%. And it was only in 2020, uh, 2020 as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, which proved too much for the Philippine economy, that GDP contracted by 9.5%. No? But uh, you can argue that this was government-induced and resulted from the necessary lockdowns. So without the very strict ECQ that the government required during those uh, early, early months of the pandemic, then the Philippines would probably have managed growth nonetheless. So the, the reason behind this resilience in Philippine economic growth really has been resilience in personal consumption expenditure. So here you can see as represented by the red line, how consistent personal consumption expenditure, uh, expenditure growth has been from 1997, no? the, despite the more volatile swings of Philippine GDP. No? So you will note that in 1998, uh, personal consumption is still managed to grow by more than 5%, despite the 0.5% contraction in GDP. And similarly, in 2009, despite the global financial crisis resulting from the collapse of Lehman Brothers, we still saw uh, personal consumption growth of about 3%. And again, it was only in 2020, as a result of the strict lockdowns enforced by the government, that personal consumption actually fell by about 8%. Now, after 2020, though, you will also see the sharp increase in personal consumption spending and consequently the corresponding recovery as well of Philippine GDP. Now, in turn, this resilience of personal consumption expend, uh, spending, I think, may be attributed to consistency in OFW cash remittances. So this graph shows you consistent and steady increase in OFW cash remittances all the way to hitting uh, more than $32 billion by 2021. 
at the same time, there has been a steady decline in unemployment and underemployment. And you can see that on this slide from 1997, during which the underemployment rate was close to 25% and the unemployment rate was close to 10%. We have seen a steady decline in the unemployment and underemployment rates such that by 2019, the unemployment rate was already closer to 5%, while the underemployment rate was closer to 15%. And again, although we saw an increase during the pandemic years from 2020 to 2021, there has been already an improvement in the unemployment and underemployment numbers to approximately 5% and 15% uh, respectively. This graph now shows you how we have recovered from uh, the, pre the pandemic debacle and such that our fourth quarter GDP, I'm sorry, such that our 2020, 2022 GDP on a per quarter basis is already higher than the 2019 GDP levels on a per quarter basis. For example, if you look at the red bars, these are the first quarter 2019 to 2022 GDP levels and you can see that 2022 GDP is already higher than 2019 GDP and then if my if I may skip all the way to the fourth quarter as represented by this uh, lilac bars you can see that the fourth fourth quarter 2022 GDP is already significantly higher than the fourth quarter 2019 GDP. So in summary, in terms of GDP, in 2022, we have already surpassed the 2019 GDP levels. Uh, which is not to say that our problems are over. No? As we all know, as COVID-19 eased, there was the Ukraine-Russia war beginning in February last year. And that triggered global inflation with the consequent ramifications on monetary policies, FX rates, and capital markets. In the Philippines, that translated to January 2020, 2023 inflation of 8.7%, the highest since November 2008. 20, so the left graph shows you the uptrend in inflation. particularly from January 2022. And this was primarily a result as well of the Ukraine-Russia war. Now, on the other hand, on the right panel, you can see the movement of the peso dollar as a result of the impact of uh, inflation and the consequent increase by the U.S. Fed of its policy rates. No? So in order to combat inflation in the U.S., the U.S. Fed had to undertake an aggressive monetary tightening program by increasing its policy rates. And consequently, that resulted in the peso to depreciate relative to the U.S. dollar by as much as 16% by September 2022. And you can see that on the rightmost portion of this graph to your right. In addition, the peso also faced additional pressures as a result of the higher import prices, again resulting from the Russia-Ukraine war. No? So the high import prices, primarily the price, the high price of crude oil, bloated the current account deficit in 2021, such that the current account deficit resulted in a negative six billion dollars. And then in the six months of last six months of last year, the current account deficit doubled to $12 billion relative to the $6 billion deficit in 2021. Now, in order to support the peso and prevent further depreciation, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas by May of 2022 started increasing its own policy rates and cumulatively from May 
until February of this year, the BSP has already hiked its policy rates by a cumulative 400 basis points. In line with the BSP, BSP's policy rate hikes, banks' average lending rates also started to increase. So on the left, you can see the monthly average lending rates of banks from January 2019 until December 2022. And although you can see a downtrend from January 2019 until around March of 2022, then beginning of May, you can see that sharp uptrend already moving closer to 7% by November of 2022. On the other hand, within a longer term historical perspective, you can see on the right that coming from banks average lending rate of higher than 20% during the Asian financial crisis, we have already trended down since to approximately 10% during the global financial crisis of 2008 to 2009. And the more recent numbers are represented by this area enclosed by that red, uh, red circle. And you can see that, again, um, over the shorter term period, there is that upward movement no, moving to the right. And that started in May of 2022. In consideration of the pesos depreciation, as well as the higher interest rate environment, the national government has downgraded the GDP forecast for the Philippines for 2023 and 2024, as you can see on this table. So from the previous 6.5% to 8% GDP growth for this year, the national government has downgraded that to 6 to 7%. Although for next year, it has been more optimistic, expecting 65 to 8% growth from the previous 6 to 7% growth. No? So the government seems to be looking at a catch-up in 2024. On the other hand, if you look at the forecast of multilaterals, namely the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the Asian Development Bank, as well as ratings agencies, including S&P, Fitch Ratings, and Moody's Analytics. The median forecast for 2023 GDP is 5.75%, which is below the government's forecast of 6-7% for this year. While for 2024, only the IMF and the World Bank have forecasts and the median is 5.9%, well, 5.95, in comparison with the 6.5% to 8% forecast of the national government. On the other hand, these are the other macroeconomic forecasts by the national government for selected economic data. So if you look at 2023, the budget deficit is expected to hit 1.4 trillion pesos. That's equivalent to 6.1% of GDP. The peso is expected to average between 55 to 59. The inflation target is 2.5 to 4.5%. Although BSP Governor Medalia recently said that the inflation forecast for 2023 is 6.1% which is above this 25 to 4.5% inflation target. Exports are forecasted to grow by 6%, and so are imports. And that will result in a balance of trade in goods deficit of $62.7 billion by our estimate. On the other hand, OFW remittances are still expected to grow by 4% while the debt to GDP ratio is expected to end the year at 61.3%. Moving on to the Philippine market, during the pandemic years from 2020, 
we have seen consistent net foreign selling. And this was actually interrupted only by this net foreign buying represented by this long horizontal red line that happened in December 2021. But this was an abnormal inflow that was uh, a result of the purchase by JERA of Japan of an equity stake in Aboitis Power. So if you disregard that, there actually have been consistent net foreign selling since 2020 on a monthly basis, all the way to December of last year. And it goes without saying that as a result of that consistent net foreign selling, from the high in 2018 of 9,078, we have consistent, consistently trended down all, all the way to where we are now, you know, which is, as of today, uh, closer to 6,500. So all these negative things that have been happening since the time of the Russia-Ukraine war in February last year and the consequent global inflation, the monetary tightening by the U.S. as well as other central banks, including the Philippine Central Bank, and within the Philippines itself, the increase in the inflation rate to a high of 8.7% and the consequent 400 basis points increased by the BSP of the overnight policy rate, all brings us to the question of whether the Philippines will in fact experience a slowdown in GDP growth. Are companies experiencing an erosion in their profitability? And is there a risk that companies will go on default as a result of the higher interest rates? And the next few slides will just help you answer those questions. So the first point we'd like to make is that despite the recent increase in interest rates, lending rates are still very low relative to historical levels. And again, I will show the bank's average lending rate from January 2019 to December 2022. And you can see that uh, the ba bank's average lending rate in December 2022 has not yet uh, has not yet even reached, I'm sorry about that, has not even reached the levels in 2020. And again, over a longer term historical context, you can see that where we are now, and I'm now referring to the right panel, where we are now is, is still very much lower compared to where the Philippine economy came from in terms of interest rates. On the other hand, if there are concerns about the profitability of companies, we would like to show here the nine month 2022 earnings results of the companies that we cover. And to summarize, the aggregate earnings of these companies grew by 41%, exceeding our own expectations. And you can see earnings growth across all sectors. If we spend a little more time here, you can see that banks' earnings were very strong, with the exception of Philippine National Bank and East-West. And similarly, property companies' earnings were very strong, um, with the exception of Phil Invest Land and Mega World. The REITs as well did very well, with the exception of Double Dragon and Phil Reed. Holding companies, you can see fantastic results from JG Summit, DMCI, LT Group. Again, in this, uh, in this sector, only Aboitis Equity and Ayala Corporation disappointed. Among consumer companies, and I'm now on the right side of this table, 
You can also see growth among most consumer companies with the exception of Universal Rubina. And Century Pacific only posted single-digit growth. So that paled in comparison with other consumer companies. Converge and PLDT also posted growth last year. Uh, Globe was disappointing, however. Power companies, including Aboitis Power and Meralco and Semirara, also grew their net profit. First Gen and AC Energy disappointed. Mega White continued to post losses. And then Bloomberry was able to turn around from a net loss of $3 billion in 2021 to a profit of $4 billion not last year. And ICTSI's profit grew by 41%. I'm sorry, 61%. So generally very strong earnings in the nine months of 2022. And a few companies have already released their full year 22 earnings most of them banks and a few consumer stocks. And most of the earnings have also been better than our expectations. So just to spend some more time on how consumer companies did very well or how consumer companies did last year, because we were expecting that consumer companies were going to be hit the most by the increase in raw material prices as a result, as a result of the Ukraine-Russia war. But here you will see that a lot of them were able to buck our expectations. So from top line growth of around 14%, the no, DNL reported growth in revenues of 58%, Jollibee system wide sales climbed by 41%, pure gold sales increased by 11%. To strong results in terms of Profits as well. No? So you will see Century Pacific's gross profit increased by 15%. And in fact, the gross margin also widened to 24%, 24.5%. In the case of Jollibee, gross profit grew by 44%. In the case of Pure Gold, gross, gross profit rose by 12%. And there was also an expansion in the gross profit margin. And then moving to the other consumer companies in our list, Robinson's Retail, Food and Beverage, San Miguel Food and Beverage, Universal Robina, as well as Wilcon, all reported double digit increases in revenues. And gross profit of most of these companies also went up. So again, belying, belying our expectation that gross profits and profits would be under pressure as a result of the higher raw material costs. And the primary reasons we found that could explain this was that most of these consumer companies were able to sell more of their higher margin products. And they were able to sell uh, more goods in general. No? And that uh, that resulted in operating leverage as well. So I, let me just uh, go back quickly to some of uh, some of what I was discussing. So I was discussing the performance of consumer companies and I have here a rundown of how consumer companies that we cover performed in the nine months of 2022. And the general observation is that their revenues increased no, at least for most of them, no, I probably with the exception of um, well, all of them actually experienced growth in revenues, although Monde, Monde Nisin only experienced single digit growth in revenues. Uh, and that was a standout for the wrong reason because other companies reported double-digit growth in revenues. Uh, on the other hand, their gross profits as well as their gross profit margins also expanded. You know, and that basically signified that despite high raw material prices, they were actually able to manage their raw material costs and consequently expand their gross profit margins. And again, the reasons that we found to explain this 
included the fact that they were able to sell more of their higher margin products. And they were also able to manage their costs. On the other hand, if there were concerns about property companies as a result of the increase in interest rates, you can see that for the property companies we cover, which are on the screen, you will find that although most property development revenues increased only modestly, for example, Ayala Land's property development revenues increased by 7%, Field Invest Land's residential revenues were up by 10%. The main driver behind the growth of revenues of most property companies were really the significant recovery in mall revenues. And you can see that very clearly in the case of Ayala Land, whose mall revenue surged 127%. Robinson's Land, with a 54% increase in mall revenues, Mega World's mall revenues jumped 51%, and SM Prime's revenues from Philippine malls increased by 50%. So this jump in mall revenues of property developers cautioned the more modest growth, if not the decline, in property development revenues. And taking, to, taking into account the nine-month results, uh, I would like to show you next our forecast of net income for 2023 to 2024 of the sectors and the companies that we cover. So just to do it very quickly for banks, we're looking at 21% growth in net income in 2023 and 13% growth in 2024. And if you take a look at the individual banks, the strongest growth rates will be posted by B BPI, East to West, and BDO and Metro Bank. Among property companies, as a whole, we're looking at 24% growth in net income this year, with strong growth rates expected to be posted by Mega World, SM Prime, Ayala Land. We also follow REITs. And for most REITs, we're expecting double-digit growth in net income as well. Although for Citicorp Energy REIT, we're only looking at 1%. And that is because this is only this has only started operations. And then in the case of Double Dragon, only 8%. Because yeah, it is one of the few REITs that is exposed to POGOs. For holding companies, we're looking at 13% aggregate growth in earnings. Although some companies are expected to post growth of 86% in the case of JG, 34% in the case of San Miguel, 16% um, in the case of SM Investments. On the other hand, some companies like the MCI and the LT Group are expected to post a decline in earnings. Although in the case of the MCI, you will have to note that this decline in earnings is really a result of the high base effect because in 2022, at least based on our estimate, uh, DMCI will be able to more than double its net income to approximately 36 billion. For the consumer sector, we're looking at 17% growth and that growth will be led by Jollibee and Robinson's Retail. For telcos, we're expecting a 7% decline in net profit, primarily because of PLDT, because of the CapEx overrun for which it will have to uh, book the CapEx and consequently book additional depreciation expense. In power, we're looking at 1% decline for the entire sector, uh, but again, only because of the 24% decline that we expect for Semirara. Uh, coming from a 185% growth in earnings in 2022. So there is also a high base effect as far as power companies are concerned, specifically in the case of Semirara. For Megawide, which is our only construction company under our coverage, we are expecting a turnaround in profit 
to 305 million from an estimated 10 million profit, uh, 10 million loss in 2022. And then for Bloomberry, we're looking at 72% earnings growth, while for ICTSI, 10% earnings growth. For the hence for all the companies in our basket, we're looking at 15% growth in earnings after 29% earnings growth in 2022. And then for 2024, we're looking at 11% growth in net income. On the other hand, in, in answer to the question of whether there is a risk of default, at least for the companies that we cover, as a result of the increase in interest rates, we would just like to point out that the net debt equity ratios of the companies in our basket, uh, in general, remain to be very low. So companies still have low debt relative to their equity, uh, with the exception of a few. You know, so if you take a look at these numbers on the rightmost column, these are the net to debt equity ratios. And the higher the numbers, that means that the more debt they have relative to their stockholders' equity. And usually two is the benchmark and anything above two is considered to be over leveraged. And hence you will find companies like San Miguel Corp, Globe Telecom, PLDT and Megawide as the companies with relatively high debt uh, in comparison with equity. But besides those companies, all other companies have very low debt relative to equity. And therefore, we think that the risk of a default, at least from these companies, is relatively low, despite an increase in interest rates. In addition, companies continue to be very ambitious with their CapEx program, which signifies that their, their, their outlook on the Philippine economy remains to be optimistic. So if you compare 2022 CapEx plans with 2023 CapEx plans, most of the CapEx for 2023 are still expected to be higher than they were in 2022. And again, there are only a few exceptions here. And these exceptions can actually be explained. Uh, the first exception is DNL. DNL's CapEx is only 500 million this year from 10.2 billion in 2022. And this is really a result of the, uh, the nearing completion of its Batangas plant expansion. So that one is expected to be completed in early 2023. And therefore there will be no more CapEx outlays for that expansion. Okay, but besides DNL, uh, most other companies are actually expected to spend more for 2023. Well, there's Semirara, the CapEx for this year is 5.2 billion from 5.6 last year, while N Megawide with a CapEx of 2 billion from 8 billion. Okay, but all other companies in our coverage are expected to increase their capex spend for 2023. So to round up our economic outlook, we believe that the post-pandemic recovery, which has already started, would be sustained this year via growth in consumption and investment spending. Now, although we have pointed out that interest rates are trending higher, and we still expect them to continue to trend higher uh, at least until the uh, early part of the second quarter of 2023, they are still near historical lows, uh, historical lows, and they are not high enough to crimp spending and considerably raise default risk. Uh, we also would like to point out that inflation was lifted primarily by the higher commodity prices that resulted from the Russia-Ukraine war, but this is expected. These are expected to gradually ease in early 2023. And for the BSP, at least, it is already expecting the Philippine economy to return to the 2 to 4% inflation level in 2024. In the Philippines as well, resilient OFW inflows, as well as the improvement in the employment numbers that we have seen, would sustain corporate top-line growth. No? So that means that demand from consumers will continue to allow 
companies to enjoy revenue growth. On the other hand, in terms of profitability, we have seen most listed Philippine companies being able to manage their margins despite high input prices that started last year through various ways. No? And consequently, they have been able to sustain their profit growth. Now, the upside risk to our outlook is if China doesn't reimpose its lockdown measures, no? because we are in fact optimistic that the opening of the Chinese economy will in fact be a potential upside uh, to the Philippine economy, at least by way of uh, tourism receipts. And for so long as China doesn't reimpose the lockdown measures, then we should continue to benefit from that. Now, on the other hand, the downside risks include the possibility, you know, although it has already become more and more remote, that China will reimpose its lockdown measures. And as far as the United States is concerned, you know, considering that inflation remains stubborn, the potential for the U.S. to extend the rate hiking cycle and upgrade the terminal rate target. Um, at the same time, because of this possibility, the U.S. Fed is also increasingly becoming at risk of overdoing the rate hikes, and that could tip the U.S. economy into a deeper than expected recession. Because for now, the expectation is still for a shallow, a mild recession for the United States. And then, of course, let us not forget the geopolitical risks that can emanate from practically anywhere in the world the more important of which include uh, the continued, if not the deteriorating, the deteriorating relationship between Russia and the U.S. and China and the U.S., okay. not to mention China versus Japan and North Korea and, and China versus Southeast Asia, including the Philippines. So just as a postscript to our outlook, um, we would like to highlight the January 2023 inflation number of 8.7%, blindsiding the BSP governor as well as most economists, because the BSP forecasted inflation to fall within 8.5 to 7.3%, which did not materialize. No? And instead, inflation was significantly above expectations. Uh, this inflation print has created uncertainty as to when inflation will decelerate, no? because inflation was expected to decelerate in January, but with January inflation at 8.7, then there's now the question of whether inflation will be lower in February, or will it be lower in March, or in which month of the year will we actually, will we actually see a slowing down of inflation? And that has also opened the possibility that average inflation this year will in fact exceed the 5.8% inflation in 2022. And as I mentioned, even BSP governor uh, early this week, I think, I'm sorry, or was that uh, late last week, uh, said that the inflation forecast for 2023 is 6.1%. So given this higher inflation outlook, the BSP itself may have to extend the rate hiking cycle beyond the March 23, 2023 meeting and raise the terminal rate above 6%. Now, I think it goes without saying that the risk of a more hawkish BSP would generally be negative for share prices. No? And in fact, since the January 20, 2023 inflation of 8.7% was reported, the stock market has been on a downtrend. So for the PSEI as a whole, we're looking at the index hitting 7,850 by the end of this year. Now with this expectation, we prefer big cap stocks because we believe that this recovery towards 7,850 will be led by the return of foreign investors coming back to names that they are familiar with. No? So these are primarily Philippine proxies such as SM, SM Prime, uh, BDO, and so on. We are overweight on banks because we have seen an expansion in banks' net interest margins as interest rates have risen since last year, while at the same time loans have been growing, uh, returning to low double-digit growth rates due to the economic reopening. At the same time, we believe that the default risk of companies is low because most companies 
at least uh, listed Philippine companies, have generally low debt levels. We are also overweight on consumers, although we recognize that high commodity prices may put a stress on margins, we have in fact seen consumer companies being able to manage the high raw material prices successfully. No? So nevertheless, we believe that investors should be cautious and that they should only pick consumer companies with strong pricing power and brand franchise. No? So meaning to say companies which have good enough brands and on the strength of those brands we expect can increase their prices without suffering a decline in demand for their products. We also prefer better known conglos and specifically we like SM Investments and GT Cap. We're neutral on power, um, although we'd like to point out that energy sales will remain supported because of the inelastic demand for electricity. But at, and at the same time, power producers may also benefit from higher spot prices. Uh, because of concerns over continued increase in interest rates, in the meantime, we're underweight on property. And among our picks, we're also adding International Container Terminal as a defensive play and Bloomberry as an economic reopening play. So to summarize our top stock picks, here is a list of our favorites for 2023. Starting with the top three banks, BDO, BPI, Metro Bank. And then we have two holding companies in our list, which are GT Capital and SM Investments. We have three consumer stocks, namely DNL, Jollibee, and Universal Rubina. And then in the power sector, we recommend Aboitis Power as well as Manila Electric. And then finally, as I mentioned, we also included Bloomberry and ICTSI among our top picks. So this just shows you our target prices for these companies by the end of 2023, and consequently what the expected total return will be, including the estimated dividend yield for these stocks. And you will also find our 2023 and 2024 core net income forecast for these companies. And I think the more important than this is to take note of the forecasted growth rates for these net profits. So in general, we are optimistic about profit growth for these companies in our top picks, at least for 2023. Not to mention, of course, the low valuations, which we believe uh, are attached to these stocks at their current prices. So if I, if I may, I will turn you over to Zagi Kabakungan to discuss very quickly about banks. Uh, and then he will uh, turn you over to the rest of the analysts of our research team for the other companies and sectors. Thank you. Thanks, Raul. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Sir Raul. So let's start with talking about the banking sector because uh, this is one of the few sectors that will benefit from a higher interest rate environment. And we highlight two things in uh, why we're overweight on banks, uh, particularly NIM expansion and loan growth. So as you can see in this slide, uh, we've seen that loans have picked up since the start since the pandemic, and it has reached uh, double digit growth uh, since April. And furthermore, uh, we see that our top picks, top three picks, uh, BDO, BPI, MBT, have uh, shown the highest year-on-year uh, -year growth in terms of net interest income. And on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, you can see that uh, net interest margins have increased alongside with the uh, rising interest rates as well. So we like BDO, uh, particularly because it will benefit the most from the economic reopening. It also has uh, a high cash ratio of 82%, which uh, will bode well for its NIMS. And we also like BPI because it has the fastest loan growth. It has the lowest NPL ratio, the best asset quality. And lastly, uh, we like Metro Bank 
because it also has uh, the highest capital car level. And it's also the second in second best in asset quality. And uh, to give some, to uh, tell Metrobank apart from these topics, it's also the cheapest. It has a price to book of 0.8 times. This is below uh, Metrobank and, ay, this is below BPI and BDO's respective PBs. So I'll turn you over now to Renz to uh, discuss the conglomerate sector. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. So overall, we are uh, we prefer conglomerates that are more exposed to the banking and uh, consumer sectors, uh, primarily because of the following. First and foremost, um, banking sectors, as mentioned by Zagi, um, would benefit the most from um, rising net interest margins as well as um, healthy loan growth. And we also like the uh, conglomerates that are exposed to the consumer sector since they would benefit the most from the reopening. And this will be discussed further by Brenda, which is our consumer analyst. So our preferred picks in the, con in the conglomerate sector would be the Philippine proxies, um, uh, SM investments, as well as um, GTCA. Sorry about that. So our preferred pick, for, for conglomerates would be SM Investments. We believe that this is the best um, proxy to consumption growth um, given its strong exposure for uh, uh, in, in SM Retail as well as SM Prime Holdings, which is the largest mall operator. So SM Retail um, contributes around 19% of its uh, net income while SM Prime Holdings um, contributes around 23% of SM's earnings. And we also like SM's exposure to BDO, which is one of the which is the biggest bank in the Philippines. And we believe that BDO would benefit the most from rising consumer loans as um, domestic consumption um, further uh, grows. Okay, so we also like GT Capital Holdings, given its exposure to um, Metro Bank. Uh, this was already mentioned by Zagino, and this bank would also benefit from from raising interest rates as well. No, and it also holds the the market leading automobile um company, uh, Toyota, which has a market share of fifty one percent. And we believe that Toyota would um, benefit the most from would benefit as well from the reopening as um, demand for cars um, sustain uh, sustain its growth. And we would like to highlight GT Caps um, uh, and undervaluation. It's very uh, it's it's very undervalued valued given its um, discount nav of fifty four percent. And therefore, we believe that the upside for GT Cap would be um, very significant in our view. So that's all for the conglomerate sector. So I turn you over to Brenda to discuss the consumer sector. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Brenda again. Um, we are... Uh, overweight in the consumer sector because we believe in the high growth perspective, um, perspective coming from the economic reopening um, narrative. No? Um, with, in this sector, we prefer consumer staples um, over the cyclicals because of the high inflation, uh, inflationary environment that we have right now. Um, as you know, um, last January, we reported an 8.7% um, inflation rate, rate which is like an all-time high um, from the last like 10 to 15 years um so we also like the um companies who are able to mitigate um inflation through um through um the means that Sarah all said earlier um first being um able to um sell high margin um products and second through price um uh, pa passing of costs um or price improvements 
And we also are partial to market leaders with high pricing power um, and wise of geographical presences because we believe that they're able to manage their pricing um, and cost mechanisms more effectively than other um, companies. Um, however, if you can see here in our table, we do recommend them almost all of the consumers because of um, the high growth um, that we were talking about earlier, um, except for FB here, which is on hold because of the expensive price um, at the moment. Okay, um, so next, I'll quickly go to this next slide, um, which is a catalyst for consumers, um, as I said, mainly um, economic reopening. So here it's mobility that's um for that's ushering growth both from the demand and supply side from the supply side um the easing of um of economies have improved supply lines, boosting supplies and reducing um, logistical costs. You can see here um, that the freight um, rate index has gone down already as opposed to the all-time high um, in 2021. Whereas on the um, demand side, um, this has ushered um, an improvement in foot traffic in most public spaces with the assumption of work in office and back to school trends. Um, on the bottom, um, uh, chart here, you can see the mobility trend. Um, most of the time we spend on outside spaces are all on the uptrend. Oh, sorry. Okay. Whereas the green line is going down. Um, this is the duration of time we spend um in our home. Um. Um, with that, we are likely to benefit from an extension of revenge spending, um, albeit more subdued, most likely coming from the middle to high income um, families. As you can see in the, our consumer confidence index, we're all um, going up already, even though we're still a bit on the negative. Um, moreover, we believe that the um, opening of economies would usher in more um, demand from tourism, both domestic and international. And another um, would be um, global commodity prices. Um, so this remain high versus 2021 prices. Um, but as you can see, it already has significantly dropped since their highs in 2022. So this is another catalyst for uh, for consumers because of the uh, because most of them um, um, do use um, commodities. So next we'll go to the um for, go to the stock picks for consumers. Um first being DNL. So DNL we recommend this because um first it has two versatile business segments um that are driving growth. First the high margin specialty products, um, and second the low margin on commodity products. Um, the difference between this is the uh, uh, low margin commodity products are mainly um, the ones like cooking oils, very basic products um, that have enjoyed growth because um, consumers have gone back to, to the basics, whereas the high margin um, specialty products are those that are um, that uses um, a lot of technology and development um, uh, like um, oleo chemicals, but um, but it's also growing in volume um, in revenue uh, moving forward already. Um, second, this is benefiting from the stabilizing commodity prices, um, as we can see from, as we saw um, on the earlier chart. And next, um, as Raul also mentioned earlier, the um, new plant in Batangas um, is already expected to be finished and in operations by mid-2023. So we expect this to increase output and efficiency, especially in supporting their international business. Um, next is um, Jollibee Foods. Um, we recommend this because um, first, um, they are already recovering from their losses in the past um, few years with the increasing um, dining sales coming from the economic re um, economic um, reopening. Um, moreover, with the um, emergence of a new consumer um, that um, uh, that likes the proposition of um, convenience, um, it's off premise channels being delivery, takeaway, and drive through um, have been growing up, um, and they now contribute to 20% of total sales. So they, so Jollibee um, wants to increase the, the contribution to share to sales of um, this off-premise channels by 50% by 2027. So they're already investing in a digital revenue optimization. Second, we believe that they will also um, benefit a lot from the reopening of China since um, uh, the Chinese business um, accounts for around like 10% of system-wide sales for of Jollibee. Um, and neck and last for consumers is URC. Um, so overall URC um, would benefit from the economic reopening um, and would experience um, resilience demand for their products, um, especially because um, URC products is in the 
um, value uh, is a value player, basically. Um, and as you can see here, um, 31% of the Philippine household's budget is allocated to food. So we believe that uh, most of this, um, that URC would benefit from this. Second, there's all, they are also a stable market leader. So they build um, recognizable brands um, around the globe. Um, and their product categories in the nine months of 2022 market shares already surpassed the pre-pandemic levels. Um, so they're also growing here. Um, one of the things you can you probably ask is why we recommend this despite the fact that the coronet income has declined declined last nine months of 2022. Um, but we recommend this because, as I said, first, they're a, a stable market leader, and we think that um, they'll go back to uh, pre-pandemic levels in net income um, and even surpass um, um, pre-pandemic levels um, as the raw material costs would go back to, um, to lower levels. Um, and also on account of strong volume growth um, from the economic reopening. And that's it for consumers. Uh, I'll give you back to Zagi um, with the power sector. Hello. Okay, I'm back. So, good afternoon, guys. Thank you, Brenda. So, let's talk about the power sector. Uh, basically, what happened in the year 2022, uh, we saw that uh, West M prices were a double-edged sword. And because of that, uh, some companies like ASEN, FGEN uh, performed badly, while the rest, uh, AP, SEC, and Meralco, uh, performed steadily or performed better, actually. So, without further ado, let's uh, talk about our topics. Avoid these power first. So we like avoid these power because of the expected demand recovery, uh, despite the high electricity prices. So uh, energy sold in the first nine months rose 19%. And it's also a beneficiary of the high spot prices since avoid these power sells 20 to 30% of its total capacity to the spot market where prices are, in, in, are higher. So it also has a GNPD in its pipeline, uh, which uh, went online last year. And it's set to steadily increase production over time, uh, as mentioned by their IR. And it's trading at uh, eleven. It's at trading at, at a discount. Yes, sorry. So next, uh, we have uh, Miralco. It's a defensive stock. Uh, it's uh, experiencing uh, increased sales as its uh, energy sales have actually surpassed pre-pandemic uh, levels. And it's a defensive stock because you know, electricity is an essential product and it's uh, resilient to the high inflationary pressures. It also has an, a high attractive dividend yield of 5.3%, uh, one of the highest among big cap stocks. So that's all for the power sector. And uh, next, we will be talking about the port and gaming sector. So first, we have ICT. Um, we like uh, ICT because it's a defensive stock as well. Uh, it's had, it has a diversified geographical presence with ports in different areas in the world. And uh, we like it because uh, it will be resilient against the threat of a recession, a possible recession in the U.S. And we also see that uh, China's uh, economic reopening could cushion any negative impact on trade. Uh, furthermore, it's also a defensive against currency risk as 53% of its revenues are in non-dollar currencies. And ICT, as you can see in the right-hand side of the chart, is experiencing steady volume growth. And our last topic, guys, um, it's Bloomberry Resorts. Uh, we like Bloomberry, as you've, you've seen uh, in the earnings, earnings chart uh, or table, that Bloom uh, was able to reverse its core net loss in the first nine months of 2022 at uh, 4 billion and this was uh this recovery was uh even without the uh the chinese players okay so uh in back in 2019 uh chinese players account for 45% of bloomberry's gross gaming revenues and because of china's easing of their lockdowns uh we see this as an upside risk and i guess that's the reason why bloom has been uh trading 
really high recently. And um, I think a few weeks ago, it reaches 52-week high. And it also has another casino in its pipeline, which is expected to have a soft launch this fourth quarter of 2023. Uh, so there in North, uh, this will add approximately like 250 mass tables, two, three slot machines, 200 electronic gaming machines, and 500 hotel rooms. And yeah, that's all for Bloomberry. And uh, since we... Since we don't have that much time, uh, we will open the floor for um, Q&A. But uh, do note that uh, in this appendix, uh, we, we can send you the slides after the presentation. Uh, we, there's like slides on materials on uh, telcos, REITs, and property. So yeah. Thanks, Zagi and team. Uh, Brenda, Renz, and of course, Raul. Um, I also want to apologize. We were not able to, you were not able to see the speakers during the presentation. We had a little technical glitch and then, you know, therefore you guys couldn't have a good look at our good looking speakers. Um, but they're on now. So if, if they take the questions, then uh, they can turn on their videos um, so you can see them uh, in person. Uh, there's a, a few questions here. One was sent to me through my Viber, which I posted here, how will high interest rates rate continue to affect corporate earnings and what stocks or sectors might or most be most affected by high interest rates? Uh, I guess that goes both ways, a negative and positive in terms of high interest rates, no? Um, so yeah, that's the first question. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, there, yes, now we can. Yeah, uh, well, in general, of course, high interest rates will be negative for corporate earnings no? because that will result in a higher interest expense, particularly for companies that have a lot of debt. Uh, but fortunately, as I said, uh, most of the companies in our coverage actually have low debt relative to equity, and therefore the impact should be uh, more moderate, and for so long as interest rates do not ans uh, do not increase by uh, by by too much, no, because uh, so far, despite the two hundred the four hundred basis point increase in the policy rate, the lending rates that have been affected really are the shorter term rates more than the longer term rates, no, and for that reason. Um, Companies have not been affected uh, by too much yet. Um, unfortunately, of course, as I mentioned already, there's really no telling as of now until when interest rates will continue to go up. Although, at least in the case of the Banco Central, um, there are indications or at least the general expectation is for the BSP to increase rates by maybe 50 50 basis points to a maximum of 75 basis points until May of this year. Um, yeah, and then to answer your question on what stock sectors will be most affected by high interest rate, I think Brenda would like to answer this question as well. Brenda, do you want to answer this question? Uh, no, I'm good, yeah. Okay. Well, of course, uh, property companies are going to be affected not because of high interest expense, but more because of dampened demand uh, as a result of high mortgage rates. So that is uh, something that we may see. Uh, and then uh, in terms of uh, borrowings, then those companies that are heavy on CapEx spending, like the telcos, like uh, companies in infrastructure may also be affected the most by high interest rates. Thanks, Raul. Um, Welcome, Tony. Okay, from an anonymous attendee, can you expound on how you arrived at 7,850 index? Does corporate earnings have to grow at a minimum level for 2023? Yeah, uh, let me answer this question. We derive our PSEI forecast by looking at the target prices of the stocks 
that comprise the PSEI. Uh, and then on that basis, we look at how market cap will change relative to the current level. Okay, so the 7850 is actually based on a 17% increase in the market capitalization of the companies in the PSEI uh, if they hit their target prices based on our forecast. Um, from the February 2020, from the February uh, 23 PSEI level. And then to answer the question of do corporate earnings have to grow at the minimum level for 2023, our forecast is growth of 17%. Um, so yeah, for the PSEI forecast of 7850 to be hit, then I think it's a necessary condition for the 17% profit growth forecast to be hit as well uh, because the, a number of our companies a number of our forecasts are really based on price earnings multiples in the first place. Great, thank you, Raul. So 17%, guys, that's uh, what we're forecasting. And hopefully this can be achieved this year for the market to hit 7,850. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, from Mariano, what do you recommend for fixed income investors? Not, not so much our purview here, but... Uh, uh, you want to take that, Raul? Uh, well, you know, since we're selling equities, then we have. <laughs> we should be recommending a switch. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, I I think that uh, considering that where stock prices are now, uh, in general, I still think there could be downside, and considering also what happened today. Uh, technically speaking, there there could be a there could could there could be pressures to move towards six thousand three hundred as a result of today's breakdown. Uh, but that being said, we think there's there's a minimal downside and a greater upside to stock prices to stock prices, especially if you're looking uh, beyond twenty twenty three. And for that reason, for fixed income investors, we think. Uh, they should already start looking at moving some of their funds to the equities market. Uh, well, that being said, um, you know, especially if there's going to be a pivot uh, by the U.S. Fed and then eventually by the Banco Central, and that is in fact the expectation even in-house by our RCBC economist, then that would also be an opportunity to be invested in longer term bonds. Uh, so given that uh, increasing increasing possibility of a pivot, not maybe not this year, but maybe in 2024 and moving, uh, you know, moving further down the road, then that would also present an opportunity to increase the duration from shorter term. Uh, fixed income assets to longer term bonds. Excellent. There you have the expert answer from Raul. He's been in the market for a very long time, so definitely reliable information. Um, from Ruel, you said SM is one that will benefit from consumption. Why did it suddenly collapse today? Yeah, I'll take that question. Yeah, thank you for that question. No? So basically, um, what happened was lately, um, SM um declined by around um nearly five percent, primarily because of um heavy net foreign selling, market uh on close orders. But um, if we look at our fair value, we believe that um, uh, SM investments will, will would have a would have a pretty good upside, primarily because of its exposure to consumption and banking, no. So again, not to reiterate, um, SM would continue to benefit from um, um, higher interest rates to BDO, as well as um, the reopening story to SM Retail and SM Prime Holdings. So I guess what happened here today um, was simply just um, uh, in net foreign selling, primarily also because um, what happened in the markets today was a, a rebalancing of the MSCI which actually help, uh, moved the markets um, this session. 
Great, thank you, Renz. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, should I be in REITs given the high interest rates? I guess he means the high the current, high yielding interest rates mm -hmm. outside of REITs, right? Okay. I guess I'll take that question as well now. So yeah, um, overall we are, um, in terms of sentiment, I think um, sentiment towards REITs um, <laughs> would probably be negative. Primarily because um, because of the elevated inflationary environment in the Philippines, um, the BSP might have to raise its intra its benchmark rates one more time, and this will lead to um, an increase in um, interest rates, which would make um, fixed income um, to be more attractive compared to you know to REITs. But the 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 silver lining here is that. Um, the, the positive side of REITs is that um, most REITs in our coverage, like um, CityCore REIT, M REIT, as well as um, A REIT, they have um, potential dividend growth prospects in, in, in the long term. So that would be one of the positive sides of um, buying REITs today, since they would benefit from potential growth prospects once um, property assets um, transfer into REITs um over the in the future so yeah hope i answered your question thanks Renz. um yeah, if i may add to that I, as well um also don't forget guys that uh reits are subject to a lower tax rate so the tax rate is 10 percent, whereas on fixed income is 20 percent. so on an after-tax basis chances are you're still going to be ahead, at least if you select your REITs properly, you know, because there are REITs that are fetching at their current prices dividend yields of 7% to 8%. Um, and that will include, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, rents, but C-REIT, for example. Yes, sir. Um, for example, no, C-REIT offers a dividend yield of around 7.7%. Um, Whereas um, MREIT also offers around that rate, no, around 7.8%. Um, and the, these um, dividend yields are much higher compared to like the bond, the interest rate of 10-year bonds, which is at around 6.2%. So definitely would you um dividend yields of REITs are actually um relatively attract attractive um right now. Great. Okay. And then you. last point is you can sell you can sell your REITs if in case you encounter some liquidity issues uh, because they are generally more liquid than uh, most fixed income investments. No? And of course, for most fixed income investments, you probably might be penalized for pre-terminating your investment. No? And there is no such thing for REITs, of course. Excellent points, Raul. Uh, so yeah, REITs definitely still attractive despite the high interest rate regime that we're experiencing right now. Um, another anonymous question, should we avoid PLDT for this year? I guess given the, the first issue with PLDT and the overspending, um, and then now with the, the issue of smart being padlocked. So pretty good question. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there, there are a lot of events that... Um... Um, PLDT um, was facing now, for example, the CapEx overrun, which resulted to a 20% drop in share price last, um, I think it was last year, no? And like recently, um, the Makati government padlocked the, head the Makati headquarters of, um, of Smart, which is the mobile business unit of PLDT. Um, just a quick comment on that, on that recent disclosure, no? Um, we think that the... Um, we think that the that the closure of the headquarters would um not really materially affect the the business operations of PLDT in general primarily because um you know people would continue um uh, reloading their sim cards and i think that um recurring revenues from postpaid plans would still continue even if um makati even even if the makati government um closed um the headquarters actually just recently no um i saw this on twitter that um i think pldt already settled this issue already they already um uh submitted the necessary documents as well as um uh the financial statements that were needed to audit the company 
So currently, the management is um, really doing their best to address this issue. Thanks, Renz. Uh, and before I ask the question that's lined up here, a related one, how about Globe stock 52-week low? Is it a good time to buy? Yeah, Globe um, actually underperformed recently, primarily because... Um, um, it was part of the uh, what it was part of the stocks that were deleted um, from the MSCI rebalancing. So that's that's one of the that's one of the major reasons why um, Globe share price has declined. Um, we believe that this would be a very good opportunity to buy Globe, primarily because that would make um, dividend yields more attractive. So if you buy Globe uh, at a lower share price, then you would um, benefit from a higher dividend yield. You no. Know? So overall, um, we are still positive on Globe in terms, if we look at a fundamental perspective. Great. Thanks, Renz. And the last question here, what can you say about the recently posted 2022 net income of BDO and Metrobank? How does this affect the stock market slash its stock price? All right. Thanks for the question. So um, BDO and Metrobank actually uh, performed well. They have more than... 30% double digit growth year on year and uh both both stocks actually had their total loans uh, rising by 15% respectively and um it was really evident that uh the higher interest rate environment uh pushed earnings higher as uh, net interest margins expanded by more than 15 uh, basis points and uh, for the stock price, as you can, if you look at the charts of BDO, Metrobank, they're all trading above their 50-day EMA. And uh, it's actually on an uptrend. And it just basically shows that uh, earnings have been really going well for banks because of the high interest rate environment. So, yeah. Great. Thanks, Zagi. Um, those are all the open questions. If there are any other questions, you can catch up now. Um, if not, I posted here a little sales pitch. Uh, I see many of, of the attendees are already valued clients, but there are a few new names that I see here. So if you haven't opened an account, uh, very simple now to open an account. It's all online. Um, you just go to our website, www.rcbcsec.com, click on the Open Account tab, and uh, you go through a very simple process. Uh, on the right side uh, is our Viber community. You can take a screenshot of the QR code um, and uh, sign up and join our Viber community. We, we post daily uh, news, information, um, anything market-related. Uh, it's the fastest way probably to get information from us to you. So, uh, you know, please uh, join the Viber community and then we'll be happy to share the information, any market information uh, with you. I, I think one of the interesting things, Raul and team, is that we had basically no fall off in participants from the beginning up to now. So everyone really engaged and interested in, in the discussion. Uh, Raul gave a masterclass in economics uh, and the rest of the team uh, really uh, rounding out the whole the whole afternoon here with their top picks and explaining why these are their top picks and then going into the QA, you know. So uh if there are no more questions and it doesn't seem like there are any more questions on behalf of Raul and uh research team, Renz, Zagi, Brenda, and Julio there in the background who's been a silent operator. I just want to thank everyone again. Uh, we'll be sending these out to the attendees, uh, a copy of, of this to the attendees tomorrow. Um, and if there's anything else you need, please feel free to email us or